nuclear fallout has befallen the Earth, causing the insects to turn into huge mutants and exterminate almost all humans. A boy named Joel Dawson lives with his friends in an underground bunker. It's too dangerous to go to the surface, so the boy doesn't meet anyone else. Everyone in the bunker has a partner. Only Joel is alone and has no chance of meeting a girl. The boy is not bullied, but every day he feels like a cowardly outcast. Joel has no idea yet that he will soon make an incredible discovery and change people's lives. Joel doesn't get out of the bunker because there are huge monsters walking around. Seven years ago, a huge meteorite was approaching Earth. To shoot it down, humans launched nuclear missiles into space. Mankind managed to shoot down the asteroid, but nuclear fallout hit the Earth. All the cold-blooded animals mutated to unbelievable sizes and began to prey on humans. People tried to fight them, but a year later 95% of humanity was gone. The survivors hid in bunkers and tried to survive. Joel got into a group of nice young people and became friends with them. Surviving was easier until the group ran out of ammo. But even now, the hunters managed to get supplies from the surface using homemade weapons. But Joel is definitely not a hunter. He milks a surviving cow in the bunker, cooks food, and everyone is fine with that. One day the monsters enter the bunker. Everyone arms themselves and decides to fight back. Joel wants to go with his friends, but they won't let him. You can't handle it, Joel. You're shook. The brave hunters go out into the tunnel. Soon one of them is attacked by a monster. That's the first time Joel decides to act. He grabs his crossbow and goes in after his friends. Suddenly, the young man sees an overgrown bug massacre his friend. Joel is incredibly scared. He can't move. Luckily, his friends find him and rescue him. Joel then remembers his life before the apocalypse. Seven years ago, he was on a date with his sweetheart named Amy. The lad had sloppily drawn a portrait of her. The girl liked it and gave Joel cool drawing pencils and a notebook. The couple was happy. This has been the best summer of my life. Suddenly the city was invaded by mutant insects. The couple was forced to make a quick escape. At present, Joel is still using Amy's gifts. He draws monsters in his notebook with notes about their weaknesses. That's the only thing the boy sees as being useful. Then he tunes his radio and communicates with a nearby colony of survivors. He recently managed to find Amy in that camp. Now he communicates with the girl and dreams of meeting her. But getting there is impossible. Joel recalls the last meeting with Amy seven years ago before the evacuation. Back then he confessed his love for the girl and promised to find her. The boy has no idea how that promise will turn out. While Joel's friends are discussing the breach in the bunker, Joel asks them an unexpected question. Certainly. How far away is Amy's colony? It turns out that Amy's shelter is 140 kilometers away, a week's journey, but even the bravest hunter can only make it halfway. Joel definitely can't make it. However, the boy thinks otherwise. He loves his friends, but only next to Amy will he be truly happy. Joel decides to hit the road. He no longer wants to be afraid and takes his fate into his own hands. His friends did not expect so much courage from the timid Joel and try to talk him out of it. But it's no use. But I can take care of myself. I'm actually probably a lot stronger than you might think. Finally, his friends give him a map, wish him luck, and tell him to just run away from danger. Joel gets to the surface for the first time. He enjoys the fresh air and chooses his direction of travel at random. It's much better here than he thought it would be. He's already gone some distance, and nobody has tried to eat him yet. Suddenly Joel hears the rustling of insects and climbs into a nearby abandoned house. He's looking for food, but there's already someone lurking in the refrigerator. The lad freaks out and runs out to the backyard, where a huge toad is lodged in the pool. It tries to catch Joel by shooting out its tongue, but misses. Meanwhile, a friendly dog runs up to the boy. The toad attacks again and now grabs Joel's leg. It pulls the boy into the pool, but the dog bites the toad's tongue, and it lets Joel go. The dog then leads him to a safe trailer and closes the door behind him. Above the dog's couch is the word boy. Joel guesses that this is the dog's name. Apparently boy's owner used to live in the trailer, but she has passed away. The dog misses his owner and will not part with her red dress. But now he has Joel. It seems they can become friends. The boy has no idea how important this friendship will be for him. In the morning, Joel and his new friend hit the road together. Joel decides to carry the red dress, dear to the dog, in his backpack. Along the way, they are playing together and evade danger. We found out we have like a ton in common too. Suddenly Joel finds a bush with wild berries and wants to eat one. But boy chews on his pant leg and won't let him do it. The berries seem to be poisonous. Joel makes a note of them in his diary as he goes, which causes him to fall into a deep hole. Boy can't get him out. Joel can't get out on his own, either. And the rustling of insects can be heard from every crevice. Joel is trapped. The young man grabs a large bone and prepares to fight, even though he is quite scared. Suddenly a rope falls on top of him. Some people pull him out. The pit is already swarming with mutant insects. To deal with them, the people throw a grenade into the pit. His rescuers are named Minnow and Clyde, and they're badass survivalists. They like Boy, so they agree to take Joel with them. 
The survivalists know a lot about the mutants. For example, they remember a person's scent and can pursue them. That's why staying in one place is not a good idea. Joel tells the survivalists that he wants to get to Amy's colony alone because his heart tells him to. Kid, you ever hear the term fool's errand? The survivalists think Joel is insane because he's not suited to living on the surface. To make up for that somewhat, Minnow teaches the kid how to shoot a crossbow. In the meantime, Clyde looks around through his binoculars and declares that one of the monsters has picked up Joel's scent and is following them. They must move on at once. The survivalists plan to go north. It's too high and cold for any monsters, and there might be a large colony of survivors. Joel would like to go with them, but finding Amy is more important to him. Suddenly Clyde tells the kid to freeze and quickly give him his t-shirt. The rock behind Joel is not a rock at all, but a giant snail. Clyde puts Joel's t-shirt in its shell, and it quietly crawls away. Now it will spread the kid's scent all over the place, and the predatory monsters won't find him. Turns out not all mutants feed on humans. The ones with kind eyes are quite peaceful. The travelers quietly walk on. In the evening they stop for a rest, and Joel makes a new note in his diary. Clyde likes his encyclopedia of monsters. Joel gains confidence in the survivalists and tells them about his hometown. At the beginning of the infestation, his town was badly damaged, and almost no one managed to survive. Upon learning this, Clyde admires his talent for survival. Thanks to his words, Joel begins to believe in himself and the importance of his notes on the monsters. He has no idea yet what role his diary will play in the future. The company marches on together for a few days. Joel gets quite tired of the pace of survivalist life, but they become friends. Joel learns to shoot well and discovers a lot about life in the wilderness. For example, there is a special fern in the woods that helps with bites. Also, the scariest monster is a queen sandworm. Finally, it is time for the survivalists and Joel's roads to diverge. Milo becomes attached to him and cries as he says goodbye. The survivalists believe they will meet the lad again, and even give him a grenade to improve his chances of survival. Joel and Boy only have 50 kilometers to go to Amy's base. They set off confidently. At one point, Boy starts acting strangely, as if he has a sense of danger. He hides under the statue of a duck in an abandoned park. Soon Joel hears the sound of a mutant approaching. Right behind him, a giant centipede crawls out of the ground. Joel becomes quite disgusted by its tendrils, but the young man still pulls out his crossbow. With a precise motion, the centipede tosses it aside and wraps its tail around the duck, under which Boy is hiding. It looks like the dog doesn't have long to live. Joel lies on the ground and remembers how his parents passed away. They got stuck in the car and told Joel to save himself. Seconds later, they were taken out by a mutant. There was nothing Joel could do to help, but now he doesn't want to remain powerless and give Boy over to be mauled. He resolutely gets to his feet and fires at the mutant. It turns its attention to Joel. With a second well-aimed shot, the guy completely neutralizes the monster. Now Boy is saved. The man and the dog hug happily. At night, the friends arrive in an abandoned town and hide from the rain in a diner. This is where a robot worker, Mavis, resides. They were released just before the apocalypse to socialize with humans. Joel is delighted with the lifelike toy and talks about his mission. Mavis has little charge left, but she lets Joel plug his radio into her. He contacts Amy. She knows that he is coming to her. I can't believe you're actually doing this. I know. Joel tells her about his adventures and how brave he has become. Amy's camp is about 15 kilometers away. In turn, the girl excitedly tells him that some new people have come to their camp and want to save them. Joel has no time to find out what this means. Communication is interrupted because the robot is low on charge. Now the guy doesn't know what to expect from his meeting with Amy. Is he risking his life going to her for nothing? Joel pours his heart out to Mavis. The guy thinks what he's doing is too crazy and that Amy doesn't want him. The robot thinks otherwise. Either way, the journey has already changed Joel, which means it's not all for nothing. The guy and the robot then admire some flying jellyfish. During this, Mavis passes out for good. In the morning, Joel continues on his journey when suddenly he hears a mutant growl. And then, he sees a fin sticking out of the ground. It's the same terrifying monster, a queen sandworm. Joel tries to confuse it, but the queen reacts sharply to the noise and goes after him. He runs after Boy to wherever he can see. But he stumbles abruptly and rolls onto the river bank, losing his backpack. The young man jumps up and hides with his dog in a cracked stump. The queen crawls up to them and sneaks up with her tentacles. But the monster's sense of smell fails, and it crawls away. The man hopes that the danger has passed. However, the red dress of Boy's former owner falls out of Joel's backpack. The wind carries it into the river. In spite of Joel's pleas, the dog runs out of hiding to retrieve the dress. The monster hears the dog barking and immediately returns to the shore. Joel decides to deal with the problem decisively. He grabs his grenade, pulls out the pin, and deals with the queen with a precise throw. As he swims in the river, Joel is proud of himself, but feels strange sensations all over his body. He makes his way to Boy on the other bank and sees that giant leeches are sucking on him. The man tears them off himself in disgust. 
He then yells at the dog for obsessing over the dress and endangering their lives. Boy is offended and runs away. And Joel continues on his way and catches a fever after the leech bites. The young man's mind becomes confused. He can't feel his legs and falls in the middle of the woods. Out of the last of his strength, he finds the medicinal plant the survivalists were talking about and eats it. Not much of a relief. In this state, the thing Joel regrets the most is that he yelled at the dog. Suddenly the guy sees Amy among the bushes. He kisses the girl, feeling victorious. Then he falls unconscious. Joel wakes up in the camp of the real Amy. He tells his sweetheart about his journey, thanks her for saving him, and recalls the kiss. However, something was not quite right because of Joel's hallucinations. You kissed old Pete. Hi Pete. Oh. To smooth over the awkwardness, Amy talks about the people who came to rescue them. It is a yacht captain and his crew. The girl is just getting the colony ready to set sail and suggests that they talk later. Everyone in Amy's camp is elderly except her. But the incoming captain and crew are young and cheerful, so Amy tends to trust them. The captain does make a pleasant impression. He admires Joel's exploits and invites him to a night party in honor of the colony's imminent departure on the yacht. Soon Joel is alone with Amy. He has come all this way to see the girl. He wonders what she thinks about it. Amy thinks what he did was very romantic, she cares about his attention. But the girl has changed a lot in seven years. After Joel, she fell in love again and lost the man she loved. This is a big blow for the guy. He understands everything, but he feels heartbroken. I feel like such an idiot. Of course, he should have talked things over with Amy before he set out. But Joel got too carried away and now he's having a hard time dealing with the shock. Amy doesn't care for him. However, the girl still suggests that Joel join her colony and follow the captain. She has no idea yet how the captain's help will turn out. In the evening, everyone gathers around the table and listens admiringly to the captain's tales. He claims that people will not survive on land. The only way to save themselves is to travel by water. But Joel thinks otherwise. After all, he has survived a week-long journey. If I can do that, literally anyone can. Joel thinks people should still fight for the land. True, he doesn't have a specific plan. So, the captain suggests that everyone follow him. Joel feels at a loss and decides to contact his colony. He realizes how much he loves his friends and doesn't want to leave them. When the friends get in touch, Joel tells them about his adventures. They listen with rapt attention and admire the guy. But things aren't going so well for them there. A lot of breaches have occurred in the bunker. Now they are barely surviving. Communication is breaking down. Suddenly Joel feels he has to go back. He is out of place here. He quickly packs his things and suddenly notices a treat on the table from the captain. It's beer, which he brews himself, and some berries. The same poisonous berries that Joel was warned not to eat by his dog. The boy realizes that the captain is blatantly lying. He jumps out of his seat and runs to the beach where the party is going on. All the members of the colony are drunk. Amy is also out of it. Joel begs her to come to her senses and get her people out of there right away. I can feel it. This is a bad, this is a bad. Amy doesn't believe him. Suddenly the drunken people start falling on the sand. And the girl from the boat knocks Joel out. The guy wakes up the next morning. His hands are tied, as are the other members of the colony. Finally, the captain tells the truth. He and his gang attack the helpless colonies and steal their food. But that's not their only target. The boat has nothing to fuel it, so the captain has found an alternative source of power. It is a mutant that getting hungry will come out of the water soon. A huge monster is quickly approaching the shore, dragging the boat behind it. It is a giant crab. People scatter in panic. Amy manages to free herself and Joel. She runs to save the food from the gang, and Joel is assigned to deal with the crab. The guy isn't thrilled with the idea, but he has no choice. He finds a trident and runs at the monster with it. <laughs> Joel himself is shocked by his success, but the crab is still moving. The guy tries to attack, but then the captain presses a button and sends an electric current through the circuit encircling the crab. The mutant jerks its claws and throws Joel off. In the meantime, Amy bravely fights the girl from the gang, but it looks like the villain is about to win. The crab rolls over and prepares to attack Joel, but then suddenly Boy appears on the beach. He barks at the crab, distracting him. The captain orders the bandit to eliminate the dog, but Amy hits her on the arm. She misses and hits the crab. Taking advantage of the confusion, Amy deals with the bandit, but she is no match for the captain. He grabs some food and takes the dinghy out to the yacht. Boy runs to bring Amy to her senses after the fight. And Joel continues to fight the crab, who has not been harmed by the explosion. It periodically shudders with electric shocks and grabs Joel's leg with its claw. Amy throws the guy a shotgun, and he prepares to shoot the mutant in the mouth to end him. But suddenly Joel notices the crab's kind eyes. That means he's harmless to humans. It's the electric shocks that make the animal violent. Then Joel shoots the chain and frees the crab. The captain can no longer electrocute him. The mutant looks at Joel with gratitude and swims quickly toward the ship. He disposes of his abusers and crushes the boat like a tin can. Amy is thrilled with Joel. 
the other members of the colony thank him for saving them, too, but it is time for Joel to head back to his friends. Amy gives him a big goodbye hug. I'm so glad you came. The guy gives the girl the notebook with descriptions of all the monsters and their weaknesses. He remembers this information by heart so he doesn't need it. Joel, thanks Amy for inspiring him to come. It was the best decision of his life. Joel is already treading on the threshold of the shelter when he suddenly returns abruptly and kisses Amy. The girl reciprocates his affection. She promises to find Joel. The happy young man makes his way back with his faithful dog. At his home colony, the survivors greet him with great joy. They embrace their hero. Joel asks his colony to go with him to the mountains to the north, where the survivalists have gone. It's foolish to sit in a bunker all your life when the world is so beautiful. Joel tells the other colonies about his plans over the radio. He relays to the survivors all the information about the monsters and inspires them to go to the mountains, too. Even Amy's colony sets off. The people enjoy the fresh air and have faith in themselves. Meanwhile, the survivalists Minnow and Clyde have already arrived up north. They've heard Joel's broadcast and actually have faith in the guy. But what he doesn't realize is that he'll encounter some terrifying snow spiders along the way. Would you come out of your bunker if the world was overrun by mutant spiders?